So welcome everyone to join this week's uh, Wednesday seminar. Uh, this week we have invited Mark Tyra, a physical research scientist from National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. So Mark graduated from our department with a master's degree with working with James Farquhar. And then he continued to pursue his PhD degree at the University of New Mexico in 2013. Mark is interested in solving geological and chemical problems with multivariate tools, such as mass spectrometry, chemical analysis, computation, uh, computational analysis, and the most importantly, collaborating with different research scientists. Welcome, Mark, and then the floor is yours now. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so this is my first career talk, so this is actually a lot of fun for me. So I don't get to talk about data, and I'm not talking about uncertainty, which, as I mentioned to a couple of people earlier, I mean, when you're at NIST, you, often you care more about the uncertainty than you do the actual value that you're measuring. It's one of our faults, but it's a, hopefully a good one. And so, all right. And we'll go to what's the next slide. So what I want to talk about first is just kind of what is NIST. I mean, NIST is a, um, not too far from the University of Maryland, and there's a lot of people that actually work together at NIST and, you know, with the University of Maryland. I want to talk about uh, what I do at NIST, and then because this is kind of a career talk, talk a little bit how I got here. And I started off as a planetary scientist and an isotope geochemist, and then transitioned slowly into nuclear forensics. And... I was just going to do a little blurb of some of the things I've learned at NIST because it's kind of fun. You can really expand what you know and what you're interested in as your career proceeds. And uh, finally, just a little bit of the outlook. Like, what is it like to be a nuclear I mean, a, a government scientist? And uh, for NIST, NIST is part of the Department of Commerce and with the technology, well, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. But um, you know, for other national, for national labs, they often focus more on security. And it's, so let's talk a little bit what it's like to be a government scientist. And lastly, I'll just gonna talk a little about opportunities there are in government science. Um, there's actually quite a few scientists that work for the United States government and doing many, many different things. And um, I wrote here, uh, you know, that of course there's this, what I care about, but there's 17 national labs there's other government labs. There's the uh, uh, Naval Research Lab, which is just in, it's in the DC area. There's at the Air Force, the AFIT, there's AFTAC, um, and there's all kinds of different, I wrote denizens of Ackerman City. There's a lot of different people, uh, scientists working in government. So at NIST, I'm labeled a physical scientist because uh, unfortunately, a geologist is not. Uh, a government label for a scientist. So you can be a chemist, you can be an engineer, you can be a physicist, you can be a mathematician, a statistician, and isotope geochemist is not one of the places. So um, I'm in the lump of the physical scientist. That's fine. Um, NIST is the nation's um, National Metrology Institute, or the NMI. And usually countries only have, they have one lab, which is called the NMI of that country. And metrology is the science of measurement. So how good is your data? How good is your measurement? What is the uncertainty? How much can you trust it? And, and this is very important when you're comparing, say, a gram in Hungary with a gram in the United States if you're selling something or transferring something. Um, NIST is also uh, really, they make like cybersecurity standards. It's not just physical standards that you worry about. Um, there's other things as well. So um, most countries have an NMI. And um, as I wrote here, they uh, maintain standards, help you compare values between countries, they provide traceability. So did you know that you, whatever you've measured can be traced back to the international standards? So it's true, which you're going for the true value. And as I said at the beginning, geologists as a label is a bit of an outlier. Most of my colleagues are different things, except the mass spectrometry people, and we're mostly geologists because and, and geologists do mass spec. Um, NIST is part of the Department of Commerce. And as I mentioned, like if you're comparing a brand or something from one country to another, this is, it started off being the kinds of trade. Um, but we do a lot of other, you know, a lot of other things as well. 
And um, since 2000, there's been four Nobel Prizes. So there is real research going on here. It's not just about making standards. There's other things also involved. And, and some Nobel Prizes can come out because you are trying to find the best way to make a uh, standard. And, uh, and that's been what we see I've done. So at NIST, my job primarily is to make isotope reference materials, IRNs. And my primary goal is for nuclear forensics or national security. And here in the pictures, this is the um, HYPER, the um, uh, high flux uh, reactor at Oak Ridge National Lab. And this is during when, when the um, uranium has basically burned itself out and you need to replace the uranium source. There's a lot of um, very radioactive daughters that are in the fuel, which is why you have the, the glowing here. And, uh, uh, so my lab is under construction right now and it's just here on the right. And you can see there's an ICPMS. This is an element two in the front. There's just another ICPMS in the background here that we have, and we're going to have to figure out what to do with it. We actually found it in the basement during the um, our, our building was under a huge construction site. Um, back here is a um, uh, X ray, um, uh, XRF, an X ray fluorescence um, instrument that you can look at um, composition, the chemical composition of things in situ. And far in the back are stuff that I love from my grad work and these are cryptographic microscopes. And so at NIST, I, my primary goal is to make nuclear forensics reference materials, but a lot of the stuff we do have multiple purposes. So right now I'm working on something that doesn't have a multiple purpose and that's a surrogate or urban post-detonation debris um, reference material. So it's a very morose um, reference material and that's it's to simulate what happens if a um, nuclear device went off in your city, what would the debris look like? So you can try to do measurements and find out where this was made, uh, who made it. And something that's more applicable to many geologists is we we're hoping to work on a strontium 84 spike um, reference material next, which will be useful for like, rubidium strontium dating uh, for geologists and also for um, measuring strontium 90 and once again for the nuclear forensics part, since strontium 90 is a fission product. Uh, so those are some of the things I do. Making reference materials means you try to find a material that's homogenous enough, and then you measure it to death. And that's what you do, basically. And, you know, you're trying to get the best material and get the best measurement. So um, whatever you measure, be it isotopes or anything, it often depends. It doesn't matter how good the machine is. If your refer references that you base your measurement on aren't good, then that's as good as you can do with your measurement. And so my job is trying to improve the reference material so you can improve the accuracy and precision of your measurements. So not only do I work on reference materials, so remember I said there was like four um, uh, recent Nobel Prizes, and that's because the side project. So you have your basic science that you work on is what people that I work with work on. And then, but also usually get involved in things that are of national interest. So like neutrinos. So we've been investigating reactor neutrinos. So I have a picture of Hyper here is because we had a neutrino detector parked next to Hyper. We did, and we're hoping to have another if we built next year. Um, and so that's one of the things that I've been involved with because we can measure lithium-6 and lithium-6 is one of the um, primary constituents in the detector fluid for this kind of neutrino measurement. Um, we help with lab efficiency testing. So you have reference materials, you send them off to other labs and you check how well you can do. Um, if you can't measure something well, then your data and whatever experiment that you're doing is in, it, it's not going to hold up. And so making sure that your lab not only can measure something well, but it's comparable to other labs is very important. And that's one of the things some of my colleagues do. Uh, medical isotopes, um, usually I'm measuring either stable things in this uh, mass spec or very long-lived nuclides. But we are planning to put a, some medical isotope uh, in, in there, like a copper 64. Copper 64 decays to nickel 64 and to zinc 64. And um, the branching ratio actually isn't that, it could be better. 
And so we're going to take a thing that you use for, you put it into a patient and we can do positron emission imaging to see where, say, your cancer is. And the Topper 64 is good to produce images, but also we can attack the cancer at the same time. So it's good to know a little bit about what happens with that copper once it's in you. And uh, lastly, we do international collaborations and in comparisons. So as I mentioned before, NMIs, they're comparing, not only are we helping labs stay accurate, but we also have to test ourselves. And so we, um, we test, like we have um, the National Physical Laboratory in um, UK, we have BIPM in Paris. And so we're all trying to always test ourselves because you can't really test everyone in your country unless you know that you're good yourself. And um, so that's also pretty important as well. So if there's any questions, just go ahead and interrupt because uh, I don't have many slides, but I do like to talk. So um, hopefully that's, yeah. So how I got here, it was, you know, the question is, is it luck? And it, as anything is, often it's partly that way. And keep in mind that there's not many people in the audience, but keep in mind that um, you know, only about 20% of PhD and graduates go into academia. And so I wrote them, I put them as four leaf clovers, which now that I'm thinking about, it might be a mistake since I'm not the four leaf clover, I'm in the other 80% of three leaf clovers right now, but um, it's, it's a good. But, um, so most jobs are here in the middle and only the outliers that's going to get back at the end And so that's not saying that's bad. That's not saying it's good. It's just saying what it is. And where I ended up and what I'm doing, I actually enjoy it. And you can have a great job outside of academia. Um, things to note to get to um, where I am or where if you're going to academia or to a national lab or to NIST or another job. Um, in grad school, you got to be productive, you know, studies, papers. And for me, I mean, it was very important to networking or how I got here. So you, you got to work the conferences. And that means so many grad students I know will go to a conference and they just hang out with people at your same institution and go out to dinner with people that you already know, you know, have breakfast with people that you already know. And that can't happen. You've got to work the conference and talk to new people, people that are in the field. Um, stay connected with them, you know, follow up later, ask questions during talks, make collaborations, get onto boards, chair sessions. Basically, you know, to me, networking was really important and uh, it's got to be work. And I'm looking to see you keep the current. Um, I think networking is probably more important because you can all, you know, that's just me. Um, be rational about your options. Like I mentioned here, you know, like 80% of people don't go back to doing this. So, you know, and it's fine. Think about what you want to do and what would be best to get you there. And uh, for, for my story, um, my uh, master work at University of Maryland, I worked with people at um, UCSD, so University of California in San Diego and Arizona State University. So I collaborated there for the PhD. I worked at Caltech and Livermore. Um, and that's where I learned about nuclear forensics. So as I was doing, um, I studied meteorites. So I took composition of secondary minerals and meteorites. But the same people I was trying to measure these um, extinct uh, radiometric uh, being uh, these nuclides also work with nuclear forensics. So you do cosmic chemistry and you do nuclear forensics. And it's the same, it's very similar work actually. And so there was a good link there. And so I was introduced to nuclear forensics at Livermore when I was doing my graduate work. So again, the, with the networking and collaborations, to me, that's everything. I, can, I enjoy it. And this now, um, that neutrino project is um, headed by one person at uh, Livermore, one person at NIST, and primarily by Warren Lippi at Yale. And so it, it's great. You know, we, I helped build this large detector, I would go take the train up to Yale and go uh, spend a week there. And the um, like, little grad student would tell me what to do. And so it was, it's always a lot of fun and it helps work with that as when you meet uh, good people to work with. So as I said, cosmic chemistry and nuclear forensics, they do have an affinity. Uh, many of the same short-lived. Uh, I learned really quick at NIST that what I thought was short-lived, which is my work was in manganese 53 and how the codes chromium 53. And it's got like a, a 3.7 millimeter half-life. 
And to the missed people I work with now, that was an enormous half-life. As a child, is that's a short-lived half-life, and it was dead, you know, just a couple million years after the beginning of the solar system. But to a mister, uh, that that was incredibly long lived. So that's why I put that in parentheses. Um, so, but some of the same systems that were here at the beginning of the solar system um, were produced during nucleosynthesis um, by you know um, supernova, maybe before the solar system came together. And perhaps during one that was close to the nebula that maybe triggered it and ejected some of the material that's still up to date. Um, but some of the same systems will work in cosmic chemistry as are in nuclear chemistry. So basically, if you can date a rock, and I wrote here some of the period page, you know, A period, and the activity of material is lambda and the you know, number of atoms of the material. And lambda is just a constant, and that's got your half life built in. You know, if you can do, do this, or if you can use this equation, which is how much material you've got now, which is how much you started with, and how it decayed in the time that's elapsed, then you can do nuclear forensics. You data well, you can data nuclear material. And um, some of the same techniques also are applicable for both um, our fields. So I used um, a SIM, secondary ion mass step, to uh, look at oxygen isotopes in periods of um, a big carbon ink that's maybe 200 microns across. Um, and you can see my little sin spots. And this is when I was looking at oxygen isotopes, but also the manganese, as I mentioned. Um, same techniques would be used for looking at this carbon ink as you would look at this lead particle that's from Trinity and um, that was blown up in the first nuclear test in New Mexico that went off in 1945. So you use the same microscopy, you use the same dating techniques. It's all very similar, and it's the same people. So, so, as I mentioned, since I did cosmochemistry, that but I still didn't think of the periodic table as I do now. And so you, you learn on the job. So doing nuclear forensics and also just working with a bunch of physicists, as I would call them, it helps you think about the periodic table in a different way, at least for me. So, you know, the periodic table uses the same thing with columns and rows and what that means for chemistry. But if you stretch it out using the neutron count as the um, third dimension um, in the chart of the nuclides, you can kind of actually look at it in a new way. And when you do that, you open up new possibilities. So to a isotope geochemist, or um, I had a, um, one of my um, um, now colleagues who was on my committee for my PhD, Zach Sharp, and we called stable isotope people stable isostatists, which is uh, kind of hard to say actually, but uh, yeah, that's what we, we call himself. So anyway, manganese only has one. If you read a stable isotope textbook, it would be kind of pointless because there's only one isotope of manganese. But if you look at the periodic table and you happen to have a reactor, then there's a lot more possibility with manganese. You've got manganese 54, which decays the electron capture and has a half-life of about a year. And this is actually on the surface of the Earth. It's formed by cosmic ray interaction with iron and chromium that's on the surface. Um, you have manganese 53, which was my friend for my PhD work because that's one of the isotopes that I used. But it's also the case the electron capture has about a three, almost a four million year half life. And even the medical isotope manganese 52, you could actually use that. You can make a spike, inject it in something in your chemistry. And now you've got chromium going into your sample and you can measure that. And so there's, you open up more possibilities when you think of another dimension if you're out of table, at least I think you do. And what's fun is these four isotopes of manganese, if they're in the material, they're going to fractionate like a stable isotope would in any way. So all the things you learned if you took stable isotopes apply to these four isotopes of manganese that normally you would not think of any isotopes of manganese. So at NIST, um, being a government scientist, it does have its perks. The salaries are not horrible. I mean, there's worse things you can do. Industry would be far better, which is probably true. Um, but I do get to call my shots more. Um, I work on what's needed for the mission, but I also work on what I want to work on. And usually those are the same. And so it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, you do have job security when you work for the government. So once you, um, for me, it was two two-year terms. And 
Um, so it's like you, you start off, um, well, the first two year term was a postdoc. The second two year term was just being a, a term employee. But once you're transitioned to a full employee, it's practically like tenure. And so it's, you know, your, your job is fairly secure. Benefits are okay. They're not as people, I um, thought the government job is such a wonderful thing. It's fine. The benefits are okay. And they're good enough. Um, it's nice to be a public servant. So you're trying to help your country. You're trying to help your uh, other, um, you know, everybody that is in the U.S. And so that does have, um, you know, it feels good to do that. As a nuclear forensicist, we're trying to keep a safe in, in a kind of a bleak way. So most of the work done in nuclear forensics is when nuclear materials are smuggled from one country to another, they interdict it, and you're trying to find who made it. And so you can use the reference materials that I helped make to actually pinpoint who um, created the material. And so that's kind of a good feeling in a way. I don't know if it would stop an event unless the same people are involved. I hope it would, but still it's a blue green. And as I said before, you can perform and pursue your own interests. So I uh, just had a paper come out in micro XRF, or they don't the reference material. I'm doing neutrino science, uh, which has been a lot of fun. So um, as I was mentioned to Laura at the beginning of the talk, we, we were looking for a neutrino that probably doesn't exist in this project that I've been involved with. But in the meantime, as we measure neutrino spectra of a uh, reactor at Oak Ridge that uses um, highly enriched uranium, you get a neutrino spectrum of the fuel as it's being burned. And so theoretically, you could use um, a neutrino detector to tell what anyone is burning in the reactor. So if we took our detector and parked it down, say we went to a country that uh, we've had issues with, with making a bomb, like a you know, bomb uh, source material, you could theoretically park this near a, a reactor if it will improve a lot. Because detecting neutrinos is not easy. Um, you can, in theory, say, no, you're actually not burning low in which you know, and you're burning this. And so it does have applicable applications far in the future. Not yet, because we're not great at protecting the trainers. They are called the ghost particle for a reason. Um, I'm doing a little bit of plasma chemistry work still, and that's um, a bit of fun. We would prefer that we're finishing up. And hopefully by the end of this year, probably next year, we'll get at least another reference material out. And so it's, it's a lot of fun, actually. So detriments of being a government scientist are, one, it would be government shutdowns. So when Congress stops funding you, or when they shut down, when they're, um, um, what would you call it, when, you're, when they can't decide on something and the government shuts down, you shut down. Your lab shuts down, you don't go to work, and you don't get paid. You will eventually get paid, but when I started at NIST when I was a postdoc, um, in the first year, there was a very long government shutdown, and I did not have the, um, you know, the funding and the savings account to float the entire time, so had to, it was a, pretty difficult. So if you start off in a government job, make sure you, the first year or two, that your one of your goals is to save in the event that there is a government shutdown, and there will be. There's always, there's, you know, in 2016, there was a couple, and I think one was quite long. Since then, there hasn't been one, but then there'll be more. I think in the Obama administration, there are quite a few as well. Um, another detriment is perception of Congress. You have to make sure you do good work, you keep your reputation up, and you don't want Congress running an investigation into your lab because of the mistake that's been made. Uh, at NIST, and not in my group, luckily, but it's related to them. Um, 10 years ago, before I was there, uh, a grad student was using plutonium and dropped a bottle. One, the grad student wasn't trained to use plutonium, and so it did everything wrong and had no business using plutonium because the person was not trained. And so not only did they drop plutonium on the ground, but they tracked it. And so they contaminated the entire building, contaminated other people. And due to a, a whole miasma of issues, uh, of mistakes. And so that caused, obviously, and it should have happened, lots of scrutiny and people losing jobs because of the mistake that was made. And it was a bad mistake. We, we have to be safe and we 
handle some issues with that. So always looking over your shoulder and trying to do things correctly is very important. Not just because of the perception of Congress, you know, this safety for one thing and you know, getting the work done and how does yeah, so it was just a, the long shutdown that arose because of it caused many, many students, many, many postdocs, and many scientists not to be able to pursue with their work for a long time. And uh, of course, recently there's a politicization of science. And um, NIST luckily escaped most of that during uh, recent times. Um, you know, like the EPA lost many, many scientists. The uh, other parts of other government scientists, because they were looking at climate change, they were under a lot of scrutiny. And most of the people at NIST were not under any of that. But in the last two months of the last administration, a white nationalist was promoted to like third in charge of NIST. Luckily, he was only there for um, like two weeks and didn't do anything. But um, politics is occasionally an issue when you work with the government. So you, you have to keep your eyes open and you're limited to things you can say. Like I can't, um, I can personally donate to a, a campaign or a politician that I would like, but I can't raise money for them. There are a lot of rules, there's a lot of ethical concerns, and there should be. I mean, you don't want to be in the government and openly pitching for this person to, uh, you know, to, for this position. So you have to watch yourself and, and keep that in mind as well. So I had to, this is probably going to be better as an email or as a, a thing to be passed around, but uh, some of the opportunities that I've run across um, that I know of um, for grad students. And um, as a, when you're still a grad student, apply to fellow, summer fellowships at NIST and National Labs, and there were a few of them, and some of them are around here. Um, you know, for it's like I said before, collaborations and networking is very important, as is just learning what people are doing in, in similar fields and parallel fields as what you're doing yourself right now. Um, so, listed here, I've got the Department of Defense and the uh, Department of Homeland Security. There's the National Technical Nuclear Transit Center. And there's two different ways you can go about it. So you have O-RISE, which is run by Oak Ridge, and they have different programs related to the Department of Defense. DHS is more about security, nuclear forensics, isotope gun measurements, and that's what we're the same for the International Technical Nuclear Forensic Center. They're the ones that get me my postdoc. So when I first came to NIST, so the first two years was funded by the National Technical Nuclear Forensic Center. Um, at the Department of Energy, there's many, many postdoc opportunities. I mean, we've got 17 national labs, and there's a lot of good work going on at them. You have Idaho um, National Lab, you have Lano, which helped in my PhD, um, that Livermore, you've got um, Savannah River, you've got Oak Ridge, you've got um, Arena, Argonne. So there's a few very large national labs, and they um, are very related to what you do as a as a you know, NGO science, where some of the work is, some of it won't be, it's going to be way out there. So this picture that I have here is, um, um, is the, the National Ignition uh, Facility at uh, Livermore. They, they're shooting enormous lasers to cause fusion, and it's just a mountain. But uh, uh, other places you can go for postdoc or leads for postdoc would be, of course, the National Academy of Sciences. They have the NRC. So most postdocs at NIST are NRC postdocs. I was a nuclear forensic postdoc, but most of them come through the National Academies um, site. In this specific, there's an link here. There's the NASA postdoc from um, NPP, and of course uh, the USGS, the um, United States Geological Survey, and it has the Mendenhall postdoc, and the, there's a NASA USGS um, one as well. And, uh, I guess that's all I'm going to say here. So this, I um, take a picture of this, or, you know, take a screen capture where I can send you the information later. And, um, and that's all I really have. And I will go to your other thread, not thinking about uh, that someone studying neutrinos would be in your audience. But if you don't ask questions, also I'll delve into neutrino phases. So uh, you know, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? What this is right here is this prospect and it's the, the big detector that was involved in. 
And this is reactor on, off, and reactor on. So this proves that we can actually measure neutrinos. Darn it. So, yeah. <laughs> Phil, you can go ahead. Hey, Mark, I have a comment and, yeah. uh, and then a question. Um, I don't think we should be offended that the uh, federal government does not recognize geologists sets out of the USGS as uh, 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 important entities, government labs like the NIST. I just counted eight geologists who are alums of our department who are employed at at NIST, and I'm sure there are more, but eight is what I uh, just came up with. Yeah, I, question go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. And, and in fact, I think the nuclear program at um, NIST was started by one of our alums, Jennifer Verkuteren, who might uh, still be there or might be retired at this point. I don't know. Can you tell me what was the Jennifer, name Jennifer Verkuteren um, was an Ann Wiley student back, I have no idea when, late 70s. Okay. Something like that. No, uh, NIST. NIST was in the news last week um, concerning their uh, nuclear reactor. Do you do any experiments with the reactor? Uh, um, I have done some over there. So mostly uh, uh, you take a sample and bar bombard it with neutrons and then you look at the spectra and figure out what the chemistry was. So INAA, yeah. But yeah, they're shut down right now and will be for a while. Yeah. Uh, because, of the, because of the incident or? Yeah, and... And because, well, there's cleanup. Unfortunately, the whole, the, um, the control room was slightly contaminated with the fission products. And but the big thing is just what happened. They, um, so they have to decontaminate the whole place. It was, luckily, there wasn't a whole lot of contamination, but the fact that it happened is, is uh, problematic. And um, so the, um, you know, many parts of the control room were actually uh, slightly contaminated. So somehow something happened with the, the new fuel and, and then it obviously exhaled and some of it got out into the, um, into the, the building. And which is just, uh, luckily the, the levels are tiny, but it's still, that should not happen. So, and so we think, or some people think that might be related to the fuel composition itself. The same company that, um, if you remember, Hyper had something happen about three years ago, two or three years ago, with their fuel, doing this fuel change. And I think it's uh, the same or a related thing, because it's the same company making the fuel. So something uh, in the composition went off. So, yeah. During yeah, normal times. I'm sorry, go ahead. During normal times, is there uh, uh, an opportunity for outside researchers to use that reactor for INAA work? I know that's something they used to do, um, but I haven't heard of anyone doing that in, in years, maybe decades, yeah. actually. And they will actually pay for it. There's a, um, there's every year, there's a grant uh, opportunities that you can use to, so you can do INAA and other work on their, um, on their, long, their neutron lines. Mm -hmm. So I can actually get that information out to you if you want it or to, uh, because yeah, that could be really useful for some students for sure. Sure. Yeah, I mean it's a user facility, the public can use it when it's when it when it's running again. And that's yeah. gonna be um, unfortunately at least six months because they can't even check the fuel out until they've decontaminated the area around it and find out what went on for real. And so it's it's it hurts. It hurts a lot. That's a great facility. It's probably one of the best. Thank, thank you. And then we have James. James, go ahead. Hi, Mark. Hey. Um, I, I, did, I, I sat on the, or sit on the NRC postdoc review panel, and I know that the, the ones for NIST are really competitive and require a lot of, um, a lot of homework to line up. I also know you can apply time after time for them. Yeah. In the list of um, postdoc opportunities that you made, how are, are all of them across the board equally competitive? Are there some that are better for students that we might be producing or some that are worse? There, let me try to think about this. Um, 
there's certainly some that are less competitive. So a lot of the neutrinos and neutron work is probably more competitive. The, um, the way I've seen people that I know work it is you talk with one of the advisors beforehand. And, and that's pretty much the only way I've seen it to work successfully. So it's hard also for neutrino for um, NRC advisors to have to get postdocs often. And just for what you said. And so having the two collaborate beforehand apparently seems to work a little better. Yeah, no, a absolutely. I mean, so with with what I saw and, and what I've seen, it depends a lot on the qualifications of the person. It depends a lot on the, how the proposal meshes with the um, lab and, and what it will bring to the lab. But then that has to be echoed and um, also supported very strongly by the people in the lab to show that, in fact, they can do it and they can support this person. And that and so and I think the reason why it's so competitive for NIST is that there are a number of applicants that apply to NIST. Yeah. And, and so that just means that the. The um, the number who are successful is 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 lower than for some of the other other agencies and some of it also at least with the nrc it's harder because you have to be on the list beforehand as an advisor and um, since i'm in the big i was going to do that for myself but we're in a huge construction project still and so it's not going to be until next year that i'll even consider having you know someone there because it's just not a stable work environment when you're shut down every now and again um, but uh, where was I going to go with that? I was just going to say um, there sometimes is a lack of advisors compared to the number of applicants as well. So we we just had a, um, a SHIP, which is a, um, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's high school students can also work at NIST for the summer. And uh, there's more rules and you have to be more careful, but they the, the number of applicants to recipients of the um, award were, it was very bad that there wasn't enough um, advisors. So if it's for non-NRC, I would suggest finding someone who's actually doing the work that you're interested in the work they do and come talk to, and talking to them directly beforehand. And maybe you can work with them. You know, people have been hired in just from talking and, you know, and it happens like this quite a bit, actually. We're not quite a bit about knowing, but it's happened a few times where, you find someone who works something that you're very interested in and you start talking with them and somehow you can find a way in. What's, what's the environment like with the people in the group that you're working with? Say that again? What is, the what is a working environment like with the pe people you're working with? It <laughs> can be. Right now, we're, I think our building is one of the most expensive Oh. construction projects going on right now in the United States government. It's, so it's a disaster. It's a mess. But yeah, so we, no, we all share complaints. So, but but no, we still are managing to get a lot of work done. We're still trying to help each other. And, you know, we find, and luckily other parts of this. So, you know, we have our mass spec um, um, group or team, I guess you'd call it. But uh, Jackie Mann, she used to be also an this in Maryland, um, has a team of, um, and so we actually are planning to do some work over there. So there's a lot of collaboration even across where we just, you know, you can just go over there. Once you are, you know, they know what you're doing and you find some common ground, I guess you call it. So, so it, it's, it's quite, so you're asking also, uh, James, about how this we get along or, um, it's a long-term process. So you have your old timers that are established in their field. And, um, you know, so I've been there eight years. And there's one a physicist, Ron Collet, who was incredibly imposing. And only in the last year, as we've helped each other out to find something that we've lost in this construction or help with the measurement or something, only now do I feel comfortable talking with them. But usually it's much better than that. So I'm giving you an extreme case. Yeah. You'll be an old timer soon enough. I, that's true. Yeah. Okay, nice. I thank you. I enjoyed your presentation. <laughs>
I'm interested in、um, what you do on a daily basis, and how is it different from, let's say, being a graduate student <laughs> in a graduate school or anyone in the academic position. So it's kind of I think people at NIST or some of them at NIST they call it a pseudo academic position, and it sounds like a negative, but it's not. So you know we work on. So I work. So in a day, I usually before COVID, of course. So in a day, I would have like part of the day where I would work on what I need to be working on. So I would be working measuring a, a standard or calibrating an instrument, and preparing you know for、uh, the measurement and. One thing that we usually try to do, since is because like the reference here really matters, set your numbers good. So we often will meet with people that are statisticians, and so we let, sadly, we let them scrutinize our measurement plan, and they'll tell us, "No, you need to measure more samples." And we say, "We only have a hundred. We can't measure thirty of them." And so there's a back and forth. So so half of my day will be doing、um, mission related items, and then there's a, a few meetings. With other people that you、um, work with,、um, last week I was meeting with some people from the National Physical Laboratory, and we're trying to work out a comparison so we can test ourselves. It's being in that spec, but also being working with radioactive material. Often we fall into a gray area. So you have the normal,、um, you know,、uh, geologist doing stable isotope, the normal mass spec, but we're doing we're measuring mass in Uh, yield that where people measure activity,、uh, so it sounds esoteric and it is, but it's been like an issue. So we're working on a collaboration between us to try to change that. And then part of the day also is I always carve out at least an hour, sometimes more every day to do something that I really want to do. Like、um, during this move, I found a couple of petrographic microscopes that I showed in that picture, and so I'm relearning.、Um, Petrography, and you know, so doing that for、uh, maybe one or two days a week when I'm in the lab, and or measuring,、um, doing something with a, a meteorite sample that I've got, or the neutrino project. So it's, I, I guess you heard of Google has to you know, do this stuff, but then you say, is it ten percent of the time for something you want to do? It's almost the same thing. So it's an academic and also a production mindset at the same time. So usually we've got two things going on. So does that help or? So what you end up or what I end up with is pretty、uh, days that I really have to be careful because I, I tend to just focus on one thing and forget about everything else. And so I've made it so I've got on my、um, you know my phone calendar that I get bumped like oh I need to go to do this other thing now and make sure that some of the time that's on there. Is stuff that you really want to do or learn about, and there's a, a lot of room to learn at NIST. There's lots of programs, and they really encourage you to、um, learn a new field or learn to delve into something. So you're not in stasis, and you're trying to you're actually progressing as a scientist. So,、um, but you got to do the work. So, yeah. How freely are you able to, let's say, start a new project? Or design a new project, or collaborate with more people to join different projects. That is so okay. The initial work is free. I mean, like I was saying, it's it used part of an hour or so to do something. But to actually start a, a wholesale collaboration, you know, you, I will go to our group leader and talk about it, and usually they'll agree. But sometimes, like、um, you know, during this construction time, and you know, and it was true that the group leader said that you know we shouldn't be taking on any postdocs or any students whatsoever because we're in complete chaos as the construction goes on, and it's true. So you do have to get、um, um, you're less free as you are as a grad student in that regard that you have to get management approval in some things.、Um, something else.、Um, Ah, I had something lost it, but yeah, it, basically you you, know, you argue a case, but sometimes you can be voted down. It's like in that case, it's like a job and a paycheck. So sometimes it depends on funding, and、um, 
as a government scientist, I am forbidden to apply to many of the grants that are available to uh, grad students or to PIs at a, um, um, a institution, you know, like, like, um, like James, you know, he's at the uh, University of Maryland and he can apply to NASA grants or NSF grants. And I cannot, but I can use a PI from a university. Basically, I could use James to do the BD, uh, the faculty PI, and then he could pay me to do some of the work and then get around it. And so there's there's rules in government that you can find a way to meet the spirit of the rules and, and the rule, but also get work done as well. And, um, and once you're bringing in money for a project, then your management's more likely to support it as well. So it's there's always that too. So you can go on your own to the point. And so does that make any sense at all? It, to me, it does, but I'm in it. So you need to tell me if, I'm, if it makes any sense. Yeah, yeah I think it makes sense. And then um, the other thing I'm uh, quite... Uh, wondering about is uh, how was the hire, uh, how is the hiring process like for national institute uh, or government agency? It can be long. Uh, so again, like when I was talking about the government shutdowns and how you need to have your accounts, you'll have enough money for say six months eventually. So you can support yourself with food and with rent or you know, mortgage for six months. That's probably extreme because shutdowns don't go six months, but it's a good number to think about. You almost need that for the hiring process because it can take, it will take months because there's, um, I just don't know why, but it does. So when I, when I was hired at NIST, so I hadn't, luckily I hadn't even defended my PhD, uh, hadn't done my defense yet. So, and uh, someone at NIST called me. So this is the network and why it's really important is because um, someone actually sought me out and called me and said, hey, are you, are you interested in this job? And so that was in October and I defended in November in 2012. And so, so we started talking and they talked, they only wanted to call me. And I did not get into, I wasn't actually hired until the end of February. So what is it, four months, five months? We need to actually do some math here. <laughs> so a few months went by. Um, and that sadly is typical. Um, for national labs, it may be a little faster if you are applying to a known postdoc position and they're not making something for you. So, yeah. so like for graduate students, uh, we need to prepare early in time in order to, if we are thinking about national labs or government agency, we need to prepare at least our resume and the material uh, stuff early in time in order to be ready. Um, what are the specific steps or the hiring uh, stage one, two, three process typically happening for well, NIST? Okay, so first of course, this is the talking, just to see if you would be good for it. And then there's the application, and the application will go to USA Jobs. It's a government site. So, and even if NIST or a national lab has someone in mind, they have to put the position up or open, you know, out into the open so other people can apply as well. And then there's a law of how long the advertisement has to be up. And then once it's closed, they have to process them and it can take at least a couple months. So not just the application process, and that's your time, but once you put it in, you may not do anything for three months. And, and that's what happened in my case for at least three months, you know, as they're slowly running it through. You, you can be told that you're gonna to have the job, but you don't do anything until they give you the official letter, and that can be a while. So, um, so most of it to me was okay. This is the part I don't know much about. I'm not in the HR part of this, but uh, I just know that when we're hiring someone, we always warn them that it's going to take some time and, um, and that can be an issue. You know, so they run security, they, um, they check your background, they do this and do that. 
And so there's more than one step and you will be king a few times to fill out a, a couple of forms here and there as it goes through the process. But usually, as far as you can tell, once you start, you're going to get the job. But again, you have to be sure you can live for a few months. You know, so for me, it was almost ideal since I still was um, on a uh, research assistantship for at least half of that time. You know, so I applied before I defended, and then um, I actually was hired at NIST even before I officially got my, uh, my doctorate. Uh, but, you know, as a postdoc, which was kind of interesting to me, but uh, luckily I got started before that. Uh, so, yeah, that's actually part of the, of one issue in the system is how long it can take when you are not being um, paid. Yeah. Does anyone else have any uh, questions? Um. Otherwise, I will continue. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I was wondering, you as an insider, right? Um, what kind of quality or uh, skills do you think the hiring committee are looking for from the potential uh, applicants? I'd start off by saying whatever the applicant, like usually a job will have um, specific things that it's asking for. And like at the USA job site will say they want someone who can do, um, say, run a scanning electron microscope. They want someone who is familiar with this, and someone who can do that. And it's almost like a list. And be sure when you apply that you have fulfilled that for each of these little iota, these little things that are asked for, because there's an algorithm that will, um, even if you are in mind for a position, if you don't meet whatever the person who wrote the job descriptions um, expectation, you know, if you don't fulfill what it's asking, it you can be booted out actually before you even get to that step. So you, you have to be sure that you've answered all the little parts first. So this would one, the job description, make sure you match it and or it can you know, argue that you match it in line by line is one of the things. Um, just so you can get through the, the HR um, readout. And um, two, um, I mean, it all depends. And this is huge. Um, Motion National Labs are huge, and there's going to be a lot of different things we're looking for. You know, if they want someone to use stable isotopes, you know, you need to say specifically which instruments you use and how you're actually, your skills are beyond the instrument. You know, you can't just say, I can use a, um, a element two ICPMS. You want to say how you can use the instrument to do something. Um, so, you know, if you're a specialist in an instrument, you're, that's not the way to go. You need to be a specialist in a technique or a, a field, and that's the, the best way to go about it. But I don't know if I'm answering anything of the question community. <laughs> um, I think you do. You did. You gave us some good suggestion about uh, we need to, for example, really answer the specific question that the application form is asking and be very specific. Um, yeah, I think it will be really helpful for us when we try to really to apply for a specific job. Right. And I, I guess important when you said skills, so programming would be, is always something that, be, that you know how to program, at least in you know, one or two languages, is always something that's useful, at least at NIST. You know, we're always trying to find ways to be, to tweak whatever instrument we're using. And uh, some people are better than others, but um, there's, we do a lot of um, you know, just ad hoc on programming, trying to figure stuff out. And so that's probably a skill that would be quite useful. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, we only have four more minutes, uh, unless there are more questions from the audience. Um, I want to ask 
So there is a thing in PhD, right? You could either spend all your time focusing, trying to develop a very specific skill set, mm-hmm. like be, a partic- be super good at a single instrument with different potential applications, versus you can be a scientist that working in lots of different disciplinary. You don't have the, you don't necessarily have the knowledge a depth of the knowledge as the counterpart, but you have the breadth. Um, For the National Institute, like NIST, what type of uh, person or people do you think uh, they would prefer? They want both. (laughs) Because they want, I'm the second person, obviously. I I do lots. I like lots of things I like to do, but I'm not the expert in an instrument but I need people that are the expert in an instrument and I can't do anything about those people. So I work with a person, Kevin, and he luckily is someone who loves to tweak the instrument and we have the ICPMS and he's he's working on a way to lie to the instrument so we can get to medium res, but still have the um, the great flat top heat of um, low res. And so he's very useful too. So at NIST, both things are useful but you have to be someone who can be flexible because you will go and go there and then you can you work on the project and initially you were there to work on. But with time, something's going to change and you're going to be, you'll have to expand a little bit and you have to be a little flexible. So it's almost like a, both are very important. And so I need to be more towards the uh, technical, but a really technical person that only knows when it really needs to spread out a little bit as well. So. Do you have any strategy that you can recommend to us? For example, when we trying to apply for a job, which doesn't necessarily uh, completely match with my PhD thesis, but could potentially work. What are some strategy that I can use to convince my potential employer to trust my ability (laughs) that I can do this work well, especially in the interview, like what would you do? I almost think that the, uh, being able to write a proposal, to write the proposal of what you would like to do and how to have your strengths in the proposal, but have what you plan to expand in the proposal. And even if the job you're applying isn't something you need a proposal for, I think it's uh, something like that would get you in the mindset to be able to uh, see the interview of not a problem. And if you share it with a potential person that would be hiring you, then that would also help them know how you feel and think of you or not. Um, writing a proposal, it's not just, it, it, at least in my case, but I, how I've done it is actually you learn a lot and you actually, so you actually expand your ability as you're trying to figure out how you can expand your ability. Yeah, you literally do as you are trying to look like you have. So being able to write a good proposal of doing what you just said, you know, saying how what you know would be perfect for this job that's slightly different and how you would expand your knowledge and your technique to this um, to this task. So yeah. someone else might be able to answer it better, but to me, I think I, just writing is always how I get my head around a project. And so I've got lots of old, you know, half done proposals and fully fleshed proposals of just the tasks that I would like to do, just so I can think about what it is and how I would do it. So I would say, based on what you told me, uh, I would summarize it as first to demonstrate the basic knowledge about the project in your proposal, and then convince the employer with your strong mindset that you can, a growth mindset that you can learn and then apply the current skills to the project that you are trying to work on. Is that correct? I think so, yeah. And even if it's not a job that you need a proposal for, the act of doing so would get you, you would now know what's ahead of you and so you can jump in and be as productive as possible if you hire for this. So, um, you know, it's just how I think, and there are many other ways to do it, I'm sure. For me, I'm, I'm much smarter on paper, I feel anyway, than I am talking verbally. And so I always write 
just to get my head around something. All right, thank you. I think it's a good way to tell everyone it's great to have a growth mindset. And thank you for joining today's seminar. And thank you, Mark, for sharing your experience. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.